Cool. So, hi, uh, I'm Jeremy. I work at Filecoin, as mentioned. Um, give a short presentation on how we're thinking about using VDFs and how exploring different ways that we might do that in our protocol. Um, so, there's three main areas of exploration here. There's we have two main proofs: proof of replication and proof of space time, which both have timing assumptions. Um, and so, currently, these are like kind of dependent on VDFs in, in a way. And then we have expected consensus, which is our consensus algorithm, where we're exploring the use of VDFs to improve security, but is not necessarily needed. So proof of replication, for those who are un unfamiliar, is a slow, unique encoding of some input data. It can be any data. It protects against deduplication attacks. Um, this is important when you're like giving people some resource based on the number of replicas they have. And in the context of the proof of space time, this protects against what's called the generation attack. And the way it kind of works is you take a file, you break it up, put it into, and you map it onto a graph. You encrypt it based on the edges of the graph, which is an inherently like sequential operation. And then you use the outputs of that to create your replica. Um, it's kind of like a CBC mode encryption, except more robust against removing random nodes in the graph and regenerating things. And in order to slow this down, you can add more layers to the graph and make it even more sequential. Um, and so the main, the main thing this helps, the timing assumption here helps pr protect against is what's called a generation attack. So imagine you have an honest person and an attacker and you have some verifier. The verifier send a ch sends a challenge to each person. The attacker doesn't have the data. So they haven't done the, the seal, they haven't made the replica, but the honest person has. So when they receive the challenge, the honest person can immediately process the challenge while the attacker has to start doing this um, slow encoding operation. The honest person can respond <coughs> immediately while the attacker still has to continue doing this slow, you know, effectively sequential operation. They finish, they can do the thing, they can send it back, and it's some very noticeable amount of time later, and they get caught. So power up is a VDF. Yay. Um, basically, this whole process is slowing, forcing you to slow down an encoding such that if you're trying to recompute the encoding on the fly, you get caught. Um, and so it takes some inputs, produces an output after prescribed time. The same inputs always produce the same output. Um, and the verifier can efficiently check that it was done correctly. Um, this is done with some like snark Merkle proof magic, um, which is actually the fast part about the whole thing. Um, and so that's kind of one way that we're like, it is a VDF and you can keep it, you can, prov you can slow down the, um, the attacker even more by this graph here is actually, each of those edges is a, um, an encryption operation. And what you can do is the key derivation function for each of those lines can itself be a VDF. And so you can take it as an input, run it through a VDF, like if we have a nice fast you know, exponentiation VDF, and then use that as the encryption key for the next node. So now in order to encrypt node seven, you have to encrypt two, five, and six, in order to encrypt six, you have to encrypt four, and then that requires five and three, and which requires one. And so in order to re-encrypt any random node in the graph, it requires a long sequential computation. Um, so that's one of the things. The next one is the proof of space time. So this is kind of like the other side of this. So this proves to the verifier that some known data was correctly stored over a given period of time. Uh, and in sh so the main thing we're trying to prove here is that the space that you're claiming to have wasn't reused for some other purpose during the time period that you're proving it to us. Um, has a non-interactive succinct output, or it's non-interactive and has a synced output, and it must not be computable too much faster than the expected duration. Kind of sounds familiar. Um, so the way this briefly works is you have some time period, you have some input challenge, and then the, the, the prover takes that challenge, does some like Merkle proofs on their entire storage, then takes the output of that, into a VDF, slows them down, does some more challenges, another VDF, another VDF, you get it. Um, keep doing that, and at the end, you gather all this together, and you have to compute a proof. You know, we snark it up. Um, and then you submit that to the chain. <coughs> and so what, what we're doing here is we're trying to make sure that, like ideally, this entire thing would just be these challenges, like entirely consist of proving to me you have random pieces of the file, the problem is uh, you can't prove that in a snark efficiently. And so we lower the number of actual challenges that you have to do and replace that time 
um, with something that takes a verifiable amount of time. And so you can lower, lower that a bit because these challenges can be done really arbitrarily fast and ca are like almost cacheable if you have enough space. So adding this slowness in here. Um, the attack is if somebody can do this much, much faster, they could take, and if they could do the entire thing in this amount of time, then they could wait until the very end, regenerate all their data, and then just do it here. And so for the rest of the time, they could be reusing this space for saying they have all sorts of other storage, which is bad. Um, and so what we can also do here, instead of having each of those blue lines be a VDF, or in addition to those blue lines being a VDF, who knows, we could have a random beacon that is made with, constructed out of VDFs and use the output of the random beacon at each step to reseed these. So this, all, this means that if you have an advantage, you can't, you can't complete this early. You have to wait at least until the very last random beacon element is known, and then you're able to complete it. And so combining this with a random beacon basically allows you to prevent an attacker from going arbitrarily fast. Um, this whole process does look a lot like a VDF. There is some fixed input that produces a known output. It's verifiable um, and takes some prescribed amount of time. And internally is comprised of many little pieces that are meant to slow things down. Um, yeah. So that's kind of like the main, our main like use of VDFs in there. Uh, yeah? Yeah, so this would be like the, the rando random beacon that um, th is proposed by Ethereum people, you know, um, or some other mechanism. Once you have the randomness beacon, do you just put the VDF in the, the blue arrow again? Yeah, so here's the interesting thing. S given a sufficiently large advantage, um, let's say that I have really, really, really fast computation the, of all of this, all this work, I could just wait until here and do it all right here. Um, obviously, that's really, really impractical, and the expense of doing that and like the hardware required to do that would be absurd. But just keeping this VDF in here um, makes that much more expensive and makes it much more unlikely that you'll be able to pull that off. And it's it's not strictly necessary, but it does like this is this is a game of increasing the costs for an attacker. That's all this is. We're just trying to make an attacker have to spend a lot more money to beat us. Um, like the whole VDF thing is that. Uh, so then, yeah, then the third, the third like, piece we're looking at is our consensus mechanism, um, which elects on expectation one liter per round, which is why it's called expected consensus. Um, it includes all blocks in the previous round as parents. It's, uh, and it's kind of like a proof of stake -y, um consensus protocol. And one, the thing we're exploring is a lot of these protocols, you can look, f look into the future to see the randomness generated, like if, if you went this block, if you went this block, if you went this block, and a way to prevent people from looking into the future in these is just forcing the compute VDF between every block. Um, this is only more useful if you have a, like, a very strong VDF, because this is like 30 seconds, and if an attacker has a 10x advantage, it's, it's not super useful. What do you mean by strong VDF? Oh, so, so, like a low Amax, sorry. A what? A low Amax. Yeah, so if we can be more confident that the, the lower bound is um, a lower number, then this becomes more useful. Um, you, you also have to worry about network propagation to like, make sure your block time is right. Um, so how do we stack that not with 10x? Is the challenge to stack your average? Uh, it, goes, it, it changes a lot. The Ethereum people say they're targeting 100x. Um, with the ASIC that um, Supranational is looking to build, we're targeting 10x or 10 Amax. Um, so it's, it, it's unclear, but that's like more research to figure out what that actual number is. To be clear, the point of building this model is to give a lot of people who like, reasonably expect to have a better chance of Yeah. Yep. And so instead of running a VDF between each of these, we could also use a random beacon. Um, the random beacon means that you can look. So it, depending on how you construct it, the random beacon has this similar problem where you could um, collect all these things into the past. And then you could, since all the, ra all the randomness is now known in the past, you could reconstruct a chain depending on your algorithm. Like depending on how you, you allow people to do this, you could reconstruct the chain um, from the past. And so if you force, enforce the VDF between each block, 
then you wouldn't be able to easily go back and just recompute an entirely new chain because you knew randomness. And I think we talked about this last night, and you had a point about if the chain does influence the beacon, then that won't work. So the beacon, if you're using a random beacon like this, you need to make sure there's some reseeding period. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We just have one. It's just one beacon somewhere. You know, it's great. We could take, we could put these VDF hardware on satellites in space and just like throw them out there, and they can beam back random numbers. It's great. Just don't worry about it. <laughs> what are we doing here? Um, so yeah, that's um, that's what we're thinking. And if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, let's talk later.